Brought to you by WikiVD Documentaries. Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr Jr. was an American politician. He was the third vice president of the United States, serving during Thomas Jefferson's first term. Burr served as a Continental Army officer in the Revolutionary War, after which he became a successful lawyer and politician. He was elected twice to the New York State Assembly, was appointed New York State Attorney General, was chosen as a U.S. Senator from the state of New York, and reached the apex of his career as Vice President. The highlight of Burr's tenure as President of the Senate one of his few official duties as vice president was the Senate's first impeachment trial, that of Supreme Court Justice Samuel Chase. In 1804, the last full year of his single term as vice president, Burr killed his political rival Alexander Hamilton in a famous duel. Burr was never tried for the illegal duel, and all charges against him were eventually dropped. But Hamilton's death ended Burr's political career. After leaving Washington, Burr traveled west seeking new opportunities, both economic and political. His activities eventually led to his arrest on charges of treason in 1807. The subsequent trial resulted in acquittal, but Burr's western schemes left him with large debts and few influential friends. In a final quest for grand opportunities, he left the United States for Europe. He remained overseas until 1812 when he returned to the United States to practice law in New York City. There he spent the rest of his life in relative obscurity. Early Life Aaron Burr Jr. was born in Newark, New Jersey, in 1756 as the second child of the Reverend Aaron Burr Sr., a Presbyterian minister, and second president of the College of New Jersey in Newark. His mother Esther Burr was the daughter of Jonathan Edwards, the noted Calvinist theologian, and his wife Sarah. Burr had an older sister Sarah, named for her maternal grandmother. She later married Tapping Reeve, founder of the Litchfield Law School in Litchfield, Connecticut. Burr's father died in 1757, and his mother the following year, leaving him and his sister orphans when he was two years old. He and his sister first lived with their maternal grandparents, but Sarah Edwards also died in 1757, and Jonathan Edwards in 1758. Young Aaron and Sally were placed with the William Shippen family in Philadelphia. In 1759, the children's guardianship was assumed by their 21-year-old maternal uncle Timothy Edwards. The next year, Edwards married Rhoda Ogden and moved with the children to Elizabeth, New Jersey, near her family. Rhoda's younger brothers Aaron Ogden and Matthias Ogden became the boys' playmates. The three boys, along with their neighbor Jonathan Dayton, formed a group of friends that lasted their lifetimes. Aaron Burr was admitted to the sophomore class of the College of New Jersey at the age of 13, after being rejected once. At age 11, aside from being occupied with intensive studies, he was a part of the American Whig Society and Cleosophic Society the two clubs which the college had to offer at the time. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree in 1772 at age 16. He studied theology for an additional year before rigorous theological training with Joseph Bellamy, a Presbyterian. He changed his career path two years later, at age 19, when he moved to Connecticut to study law with his brother-in-law Tapping Reeve, his sister's husband. News of the clashes with British troops at Lexington and Concord reached Litchfield in 1775, and Burr put his studies on hold and enlisted in the Continental Army. Revolutionary War during the Revolutionary War, Burr took part in Colonel Benedict Arnold's expedition to Quebec an arduous trek of more than through the frontier of what is now Maine. 
Arnold was deeply impressed by Burr's great spirit and resolution during the Long March. When their forces reached the city of Quebec, he sent Burr up the St. Lawrence River to contact General Richard Montgomery, who had taken Montreal, and escort him to Quebec. Montgomery then promoted Burr to captain and made him an aide-de-camp. Burr distinguished himself during the Battle of Quebec, where he was rumored to have attempted to recover Montgomery's corpse after the general had been shot. In the spring of 1776, Burr's stepbrother Matthias Ogden helped him to secure a place on George Washington's staff in Manhattan. However, Burr quit within two weeks on June 26, wanting to be on the battlefield. There was more honor to be found in that area than in the insular world of the commander's staff, according to historian Nancy Eisenberg. General Israel Putnam took Burr under his wing. Burr saved an entire brigade from capture after the British landing on Manhattan. By his vigilance in the retreat from Lower Manhattan to Harlem, in a departure from common practice, Washington failed to commend Burr's actions in the next day's general orders. Burr was already a nationally known hero, but he never received a commendation. According to Ogden, Burr was infuriated by the incident, which may have led to the eventual estrangement between him and Washington. And yet, Burr defended Washington's decision to evacuate New York as a necessary consequence. It was not until the 1790s that the two men found themselves on opposite sides in the realm of politics. Burr was promoted to lieutenant colonel in July 1777 and assumed virtual leadership of Malcolm's additional Continental Regiment. There were approximately 300 men under Colonel William Malcolm's nominal command. The regiment successfully fought off many nighttime raids into central New Jersey by British troops arriving by water from Manhattan. Later that year, Burr commanded a small contingent during the harsh winter encampment at Valley Forge. Guarding the Gulf, an isolated pass that controlled one approach to the camp, Burr imposed discipline, defeating an attempted mutiny by some of the troops. Burr's regiment was devastated by British artillery on June 28, 1778, at the Battle of Monmouth in New Jersey and, in the day's heat, he suffered heat stroke. In January 1779, he was assigned to Westchester County in command of Malcolm's regiment, a region between the British post at Kingsbridge and that of the Americans about to the north. This district was part of the larger command of General Alexander MacDougall, and there was much turbulence and plundering by lawless bands of rebel or loyalist sympathizers, as well as by raiding parties of ill-disciplined soldiers from both armies. Burr resigned from the Continental Army in March 1779 due to his continuing bad health and renewed his study of law. Technically, he was no longer in the service, but he remained active in the war. He was assigned by General Washington to perform occasional intelligence missions for Continental generals, such as Arthur St. Clair. On July 5, 1779, he rallied a group of Yale students at New Haven, along with Captain James Hillhouse and the 2nd Connecticut Governor's Foot Guard in a skirmish with the British at the West River. The British advance was repulsed, forcing them to enter New Haven from Hamden. Despite these activities, Burr finished his studies and was admitted to the bar at Albany in 1782. He married that same year. He began practicing law in New York City the following year, after the British evacuated the city. He and his wife lived for the next several years in a house on Wall Street in Lower Manhattan. First Marriage and Family In 1782, Burr married Theodosia Bartow Prevost, a widow, with five children who was ten years his senior, and lived with her in Philadelphia. 
Her first husband had been Jacques Marcus Prévost, a British army officer of Swiss origin, with whom she lived at the Hermitage in New Jersey. Prévost died in the West Indies during the Revolutionary War. Theodosia Burr died in 1794 of stomach cancer. The Burr's daughter Theodosia was born in 1783 and named after her mother. She was their only child to survive to adulthood. Burr prescribed education for his daughter in the classics, language, jawsmanship, and music, and she became widely known for her education and accomplishments. In 1801, she married Joseph Alston of South Carolina. They had a son together, who died of fever at 10 years of age during the winter of 1812-1813. Theodosia was lost with the schooner Patriot off the Carolinas, either murdered by pirates or shipwrecked in a storm. Burr also fathered two illegitimate children and John Pierre Burr, by Mary Emmons, Eugenie Bahani, an East Indian woman said to be from Calcutta who worked as a servant in Burr's household. John Pierre Burr grew up to be an active member of Philadelphia's Underground Railroad. He also served as an agent for the abolitionist newspaper The Liberator, worked in the National Black Convention movement and served as chairman of the American Moral Reform Society. Louisa Charlotte Burr married Francis Webb, a founding member of the Pennsylvania Augustan Education Society. Secretary of the Haitian Emigration Society formed in 1824, and distributor of Freedom's Journal. From 1827 to 1829, their son Frank J. Webb wrote the novel The Garees and Their Friends, published in 1857. Legal and Early Political Career Burr served in the New York State Assembly from 1784 to 1785. In addition, he continued his military service as Lieutenant Colonel and commander of a regiment in the Militia Brigade commanded by William Malcolm. He became seriously involved in politics in 1789 when George Clinton appointed him as New York State Attorney General. He was also Commissioner of Revolutionary War Claims in 1791. In 1791, he was elected by the legislature as a U.S. Senator from New York, defeating the incumbent General Philip Schuyler. He served in the Senate until 1797. Burr ran for president in the 1796 election, coming in fourth with 30 votes behind John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Pinckney. Burr was shocked by his defeat, as he believed he had arranged with Jefferson's supporters for their vote for him as well, in exchange for Burr's working to obtain New York's electoral votes for Jefferson. But many Democratic Republican electors voted for Jefferson and no one else, or for Jefferson and a candidate other than Burr. During the next presidential election of 1800, Jefferson and Burr were again candidates for president and vice president. Jefferson ran with Burr in exchange for the latter's working to obtain New York's electoral votes for Jefferson. Burr was active in various Democratic clubs and societies. Aaron Burr defended the Democratic clubs and was listed as a member of the New York Democratic Society in 1798. Although Alexander Hamilton and Burr had long been on good personal terms, often dining with one another, Burr's defeat of General Schuyler, Hamilton's father-in-law, probably drove the first major wedge into their friendship. Their relationship declined over the following decade. After being appointed commanding general of U.S. forces by President John Adams in 1798, Washington turned down Burr's application for a brigadier general's commission during the Quasi War with France. Washington wrote, By all that I have known and heard, Colonel Burr is a brave and able officer. But the question is whether he has not equal talents at intrigue. John Adams, whose enmity toward Alexander Hamilton was legendary, 
later wrote in 1815 that Washington's response was startling given his promotion of Hamilton, whom he described as the most restless, impatient, artful, indefatigable, and unprincipled intriguer in the United States, if not in the world, to be second in command under himself. And now Washington dreaded an intriguer and a poor brigadier. Board. With the inactivity of the new U.S. Senate, Burr ran for and was elected to the New York State Assembly, serving from 1798 through 1799. During this time, he cooperated with the Holland Land Company in gaining passage of a law to permit aliens to hold and convey lands. During John Adams's term as president, national parties became clearly defined. Burr loosely associated with the Democratic Republicans, though he had moderate Federalist allies, such as Sen. Jonathan Dayton of New Jersey. Burr quickly became a key player in New York politics, more powerful in time than Hamilton. This was due largely to the power of the Tammany Society, later to become the infamous Tammany Hall. Burr converted it from a social club into a political machine, particularly in populous New York City, to help Jefferson reach the presidency. In 1799, Burr founded the Bank of the Manhattan Company. In later years, it was absorbed into the Chase Manhattan Bank, which in turn became part of J.P. Morgan Chase. In September 1799, Burr fought a duel with John Barker Church, whose wife, Angelica, was the sister of Hamilton's wife, Elizabeth. Church had alleged that Burr had taken a bribe from the Holland Company in exchange for using his political influence on its behalf. Burr and Church fired at each other and missed, and afterward Church acknowledged that he was wrong to have accused Burr without having proof. Burr accepted this as an apology, and the two men shook hands and ended the dispute. The enmity between Hamilton and Burr may have arisen from how he founded the bank. Burr solicited Hamilton and other Federalists' support under the guise that he was establishing a badly needed water company for Manhattan. However, Burr secretly changed the charter to include banking. Shortly after it was approved, he dropped any pretense of founding the water company. Hamilton and other supporters believed Burr acted dishonorably in deceiving them. Due to Burr's manipulations, there was a delay in constructing a safe water system for Manhattan. This likely contributed to additional deaths during a subsequent malaria epidemic. In 1800, New York State Legislature was to choose the presidential electors, as they had in 1796. Before the April 1800 legislative elections, the state assembly was controlled by the Federalists. The city of New York elected assembly members on an at-large basis. Burr and Hamilton were the key campaigners for their respective parties. Burr's Republican slate of assemblymen for New York City was elected, giving the party control of the legislature. In due course, they gave New York's electoral votes to Jefferson and helped him win the 1800 presidential election. This drove another wedge between Hamilton and Burr. Burr became vice president during Jefferson's first term. Vice Presidency because of his influence in New York and opposition to the Hamiltonian Federalists. Burr had been asked by Jefferson and Madison to help them in the election of 1800. Burr sponsored a bill through the New York Assembly that established the Manhattan Company, a water utility company whose charter also allowed creation of a bank controlled by Jeffersonians. Another crucial move was Burr's success in securing the election of his slate of Greater New York City area electors, defeating the Federalist slate backed by Alexander Hamilton. This event served only to increase the antagonism between the former friends. Burr is known as the father of modern political campaigning. 
He enlisted the help of members of Tammany Hall, a social club, to win the voting for selection of electoral college delegates. He gained a place on the Democratic-Republican presidential ticket in the 1800 election with Jefferson. At the time, most states' legislatures chose the members of the U.S. Electoral College, and New York was crucial to Jefferson. Though Jefferson won New York, he and Burr tied for the presidency overall, with 73 electoral votes each. Members of the Democratic-Republican Party understood they intended that Jefferson should be president and Burr vice president, but the final choice still belonged to the House of Representatives. The attempts of a powerful faction among the Federalists to secure the election of Burr failed, partly due to opposition by Alexander Hamilton. As Thomas Baker asserts in his piece, an attack well directed, William P. Van Ness, now believed to be in cahoots with Burr, had an electoral scheme. It was explained in a letter from Edward Livingston, a Democratic Republican representative. Van Ness planned to swing the election in Burr's favor by first having Livingston or another colleague vote for Burr on the first ballot, deadlocking New York. On the second ballot, Livingston would swing three House Republicans from the vulnerable states of New York, New Jersey, and Vermont to vote for Burr. Despite this plan, Livingston changed his mind on his way to Washington. This was likely due to a strong belief that some Federalists would vote for Jefferson so as to avoid a hung election. Despite Livingston's last-minute renege, Jefferson lost the first ballot, because Burr's supporters scrambled to keep Maryland voters on the side of the Federalists. Even so, there was little instability on the Democratic-Republican side of the ticket on the second ballot. Ultimately, it took 36 ballots before James A. Bayard, a Delaware Federalist, and several of his Federalist colleagues submitted blank votes to decide the election in Jefferson's favor. Mudslinging was heavily used against the candidates, specifically Burr. In the general campaign, the public went at each other's throats, so to defend the candidate thought best qualified to lead the country. While Van Ness and Burr had their own plans to turn the election in their favor, James Cheatham, a supporter of Clinton, had a plan to discredit Burr. Cheatham released Van Ness' letter. When Burr showed interest in certain Federalists, Cheatham and Dewitt Clinton accused Burr of tampering with New York's electors accusing Jefferson of buying off wavering Republicans to ensure his election, actively intriguing with Federalists to capture the chief magistracy in 1804. Cheatham and Clintonians published a series of letters in American Citizen. These eight letters were meant to expose the supposed conspiracy of Burr, Van Ness, Ogden and Livingston. Many Republicans were persuaded by these letters. The defenses by Burr's supporters seemed to lead more adverse admissions. When it came to the ninth letter in this series, Livingston was the key to the details to take down Burr. Cheatham pushed Livingston for his details on interactions with Ogden and Van Ness. Livingston would not give in and Cheatham sent him letters explaining his already expansive knowledge of the contents of the letter with Van Ness, threatening, We stand upon the best ground. We know Mr. Burr is guilty. You have in fact, and I may say in express term, committed his guilt to me. Livingston's resistance to Cheatham's push for information on Van Ness' original letter, which he had planned, to publish as the ninth letter in American Citizen was what saved Burr from exposure, at least temporarily. According to historian Baker, Burr dragged out the uncertainty of the 1800 election to manipulate it to his will. Burr's actions resulted in general political instability in the nation. Upon confirmation of Jefferson's election, Burr became vice president of the United States. 
despite his letters supporting Jefferson and his shunning of any political activity. During the balloting, Burr was never trusted by Jefferson. He was effectively shut out of party matters. As vice president, Burr earned praise from some enemies for his even-handed fairness and his judicial manner as president of the Senate, he fostered some traditions for that office which have become time-honored. Burr's judicial manner in presiding over the impeachment trial of Justice Samuel Chase has been credited as helping to preserve the principle of judicial independence that was established by Marbury v. Madison in 1803. One newspaper wrote that Burr had conducted the proceedings with the impartiality of an angel, but with the rigor of a devil. Burr's farewell speech in March 1805 moved some of his harshest critics in the Senate to tears. But it was never recorded in full, and has been preserved only in short quotes and descriptions of the address, which defended the United States of America system of government. Duel with Alexander Hamilton Fights his fatal duel with Vice President Aaron Burr, when it became clear that Jefferson would drop Burr from his ticket in the 1804 election, the Vice President ran for Governor of New York instead. Burr lost the election to little-known Morgan Lewis, in what was the largest margin of loss in New York's history up to that time. Burr blamed his loss on a personal smear campaign believed to have been orchestrated by his party rivals, including New York Governor George Clinton. Alexander Hamilton also opposed Burr, due to his belief that Burr had entertained a Federalist secession movement in New York. In April, the Albany Register published a letter from Dr. Charles E. Cooper to Philip Schuyler, which relayed Hamilton's judgment that Burr was a dangerous man, and one who ought not be trusted with the reins of government, and claiming to know of a still more despicable opinion which General Hamilton has expressed of Mr. Burr. In June, Burr sent this letter to Hamilton, seeking an affirmation or disavowal of Cooper's characterization of Hamilton's remarks. Hamilton replied that Burr should give specifics of Hamilton's remarks, not Cooper's. He said he could not answer regarding Cooper's interpretation. A few more letters followed, in which the exchange escalated to Burr's demanding that Hamilton recant or deny any statement disparaging Burr's honor over the past 15 years. Hamilton, having already been disgraced by the Maria Reynolds adultery scandal, and mindful of his own reputation and honor, did not According to historian Thomas Fleming, Burr would have immediately published such an apology, and Hamilton's remaining power in the New York Federalist Party would have been diminished. Burr responded by challenging Hamilton to a duel, personal combat under the formalized rules for dueling, the code duello. Dueling had been outlawed in New York, the sentence for conviction of dueling was death. It was illegal in New Jersey as well, but the consequences were less severe. On July 11, 1804, the enemies met outside Weehawken, New Jersey, at the same spot where Hamilton's oldest son had died in a duel just three years prior. Both men fired, and Hamilton was mortally wounded by a shot just above the hip. The observers disagreed on who fired first. They did agree that there was a three to four second interval between the first and the second shot, raising difficult questions in evaluating the two camps' versions. Historian William Weir speculates that Hamilton might have been undone by his own machinations, secretly setting his pistol's trigger to require only a half pound of pressure as opposed to the usual ten pounds. Burr, Weir contends most likely had no idea that the gun's trigger pressure could be reset. Louisiana State University history professors Nancy Eisenberg and Andrew Burstein concur with this. They note that, Hamilton brought the pistols, which had a larger barrel, 
than regular dueling pistols, and a secret hair trigger, and were therefore much more deadly. And conclude that, Hamilton gave himself an unfair advantage in the duel, and got the worst of it anyway. David O. Stewart, in his biography of Burr, American Emperor, notes that the reports of Hamilton's intentionally missing Burr with his shot began to be published in newspaper reports in papers friendly to Hamilton only in the days after his death. But Ron Chernow, in his biography, Alexander Hamilton, states Hamilton told numerous friends well before the duel of his intention to avoid firing at Burr. Additionally, Hamilton wrote a number of letters, including a statement on impending duel with Aaron Burr and his last missives to his wife dated before the duel, that also attests to this intention. The two shots, witnesses reported, followed one another in close succession, and none of those witnesses could agree as to who fired first. Prior to the duel proper, Hamilton took a good deal of time getting used to the feel and weight of the pistol, as well as putting on his eyeglasses in order to see his opponent more clearly. The seconds placed Hamilton so that Burr would have the rising sun behind him, and during the brief duel, one witness reported, Hamilton seemed to be hindered by this placement as the sun was in his eyes. In any event, Hamilton's shot missed Burr, but Burr's shot fatally injured Hamilton. The bullet entered Hamilton's abdomen above his right hip, piercing Hamilton's liver and spine. Hamilton was evacuated to Manhattan. He lay in the house of a friend, receiving visitors including clergy, in order to be baptized before he died the following day. Burr was charged with multiple crimes, including murder, in New York and New Jersey, but was never tried in either jurisdiction. He fled to South Carolina, where his daughter lived with her family, but soon returned to Philadelphia, and then to Washington to complete his term as vice president. He avoided New York and New Jersey for a time, but all the charges against him were eventually dropped. In the case of New Jersey, the indictment was thrown out on the basis that, although Hamilton was shot in New Jersey, he died in New York. Thank you for watching. Brought to you by WikiVD Documentaries. Please like and subscribe below. Please like and subscribe below.